Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Space Warfighter Talk. I'm your host, Bill Wolf, the president and founder of the Space Force Association. And we are honored today to have with us Lieutenant General Stephen Whiting, the commander of Space Operations Command. General Whiting, thanks so much for being with us today. Hey, thank you, Bill. Uh, great to see you as always. Uh, you know, many years we've been working together, and thanks for what you and the Space Force Association are doing. Thank you, sir. Before we get started on these questions, these very important questions that we have for you today, sir, I would like to thank our sponsor, Decision Lens. Decision Lens develops integrated planning software, which modernizes how government prioritizes plans and funds. Decision Lens has been transforming public sector planning since 2005, delivering the people, process, and technology which empower agencies to effectively meet the needs of today while delivering the cutting edge capabilities of tomorrow. Find out more at decisionlens.com. Sir, a lot has happened in the last year since the last time we had, last time we spoke. And so it, it's going to be exciting to hear your perspective on all the changes that have happened. I, I suppose the best thing to do would be to start with that. Sir, what are the biggest changes and successes you've seen in the Space Force and really Space Operations Command in the last year? Yeah, you know, we just recently had our second Space Force birthday, and uh, the second year, General Raymond said, was about integrating, and that had some important organizational elements where we've stood up uh, the other two field commands. Now, Spock was stood up in the first year, but in our second year, we stood up Space Systems Command, Space Training and Readiness Command. Uh, SSDP has evolved to also take on the role of the Space Warfighting Analysis Center doing force design. So I think we, you know, as a macro success, we've gotten our organizational structure in place. And there's certainly some satisfaction with that, but that can't be the only thing that we've done. It's all about actually improving our operations as well. And, and from a SPOC perspective, Space Operations Command, one of the things I'm most proud about is how we have really leaned into Intel-led, cyber-secure, combat-ready operations and combat support. So on the uh, Intel operations teaming, we've really built in a level of new interdependence among our deltas, and specifically Delta-7, which is our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance delta, it has put detachments in all of our other deltas. So if you're an operator assigned to Delta-8 now, you have a purpose-built Delta-7 debt who lives and breathes with you every day to bring down the intelligence you need to be the most effective SATCOM or a GPS operator. Similarly, if you're a cyber warrior in our Delta-6, Again, you have a Delta-7 detachment sitting beside you, pulling down all the intel you need to be the most effective cyber warfighter that, that you can be. And so we've really seen uh, some successes there with kind of a right seat, left seat teaming model where we're trying to just really pull together our intel operators and our, our space operators and cyber operators uh, to best enable our uh, operations. And of course, everything we do has to be done relative to the threat. So that's why this Intel ops teaming uh, is so important. Um, if I looked at some other areas, still a lot of work to be done, but we've made progress in our cyber defenses of our uh, space weapon systems. Of course, our weapon systems are all truly global in nature. Uh, these are global networks that reach out to 22,000 miles over the Earth's surface out to geo. And so that pre creates a lot of attack surface uh, for cyber intrusions and cyber attacks. And so we call that our soft underbelly. And through Delta-6 now, we're working to improve our cyber defenses across those weapon systems. And uh, I'm excited about the progress we've made. In some ways, we're leading the Department of Defense and the Department of the Air Force, but we still have a ton more work to do in, in that area. But those are a few of the successes, Bill, that we're really proud of uh, in Space Force and Space Operations Command. Great. Thank you, sir. I know, you know, one of the biggest challenges with operating in a non-kinetic environment is the visualization of the battlefield. And so, like we've always been talking about, sir, a lot of people take for granted the, uh, the fact that space superiority is assumed because they can't see the impacts when that space superiority is lost. And as you just described, cyber, cybersecurity and cyberspace is another non-kinetic domain that you can't see, but we're all extremely reliant on. So thank you, sir, for, for that information. And congratulations on all of your successes over the last couple of years. Sir, in your previous interview with the Space Force Association, you discussed the importance of Operation Olympic Defender as a means for bringing in our combined partners to be stronger together in space. Do you have a commander's update on how this important operation is going? 
Yeah, thanks for that question. So Operation Olympic Defender started out under U.S. STRATCOM when they had the space mission, and now it has evolved over to U.S. Space Command, and it involves uh, our, uh, you know, three of our closest partners in space uh, today. It includes Australia, Canada, and the United Kingdom, and we've all agreed to operate together this named operation uh, in space. And, uh, you know, I think we've, we're just continuing to see really good progress there. Of course, the uh, Russian ASAT test um, of several weeks ago uh, just confirmed what we've all been saying about space. And, uh, and that gave us an opportunity to share intelligence information with those plus other partners who are beyond that circle, but also vital partners for us about, uh, about uh, you know, what, what we're seeing, uh, how we are uh, trying to characterize that uh, debris cloud, that irresponsible de debris cloud that's now been left on orbit. Um, we're also now thinking, how do we continue to evolve Olympic Defender? We've, we've had some important messaging successes, some important day-to-day -day operational successes, but how do we actually move to federating work with those other partners? Now, they've been fantastic, and they send us people to work at the CSPOC out there under uh, Major General Deanna Burt and her team working alongside of Delta V and the 18th Space Control Squadron. But how do we actually, you know, take tasks and ask them to do some of that work in their countries. And we know, we know they have that capability and that's work that we're, we're uh, you know, continuing to, to um, get after with them. And hopefully maybe next time we get together, we'll have some positive updates on how we are federating uh, more of that work going forward. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And, and as you said, it's extremely important to partner and to establish a, an opportunity to start looking at what are the norms in space and what does that look like and what do we all agree to? So I, I'm sure those discussions are ongoing. And sir, you mentioned that Russian anti-satellite test. I was listening to a discussion not too long ago with Lieutenant General Saltzman, who was there at the ops floor for that 2007 event. And, uh, you know, as the uh, COO of the Space Force, the Chief Operating Officer of the Space Force during this last event. And he said that not much has changed from your perspective, sir. What can Space Operations Command, does Space Operations Command have what they need to start to visualize this environment, to start to characterize it, to start to prioritize what actions need to be done in a, in a ready uh, training, organized training and equipped fashion? Uh, and what do you see as the opportunities here to take away from that event? Well, that was a seminal moment in 2007, and I was in that room with General Saltzman, and uh, General Burt was in that room. We were all much uh, much younger and uh, lower ranking at the time, uh, but we knew that was a seminal moment. And perhaps uh, some of the, the differences from 2007 to today was when that happened in 2007, that was the first ASAT test since the Cold War. And so we were not rehearsed, we were not practiced, and really we were having to pivot all of our thinking about how do we get after that. And, and I think when, when history uh, is written about this modern age of space, it'll be that date when the, Rush, uh, pardon me, when the Chinese ASAT test happened that we say that this, this was the moment that the modern contested, congested, uh, operationally limited environment of space really, uh, you know, really, we, we really saw it and it took off. So today, unfortunately, 14 years later, we've had multiple opportunities to rehearse uh, our ability to respond to ASATs because of countries uh, actually conducting ASAT tests, much, much like the Russians did. Uh, of course, we've seen uh, pre additional previous tests by the, the Chinese. We've seen tests by the Russians. We even saw uh, the Indians conduct a, a live kinetic test. Um, and so we are much more rehearsed for that and our processes and procedures uh, are better. We've, we've uh, fielded some additional capability like the space fence, which has helped us as well. Uh, and I think uh, as, a, as a way of thinking, we now think about um, force packaging capability. So in times past, we would have thought about all of our capabilities kind of individually, individually, but now we're thinking across all of those capabilities, how do we bring together high value assets uh, defense, offense, ISR, cyber, command and control uh, to get after operating and, and uh, in the face of these threats. And so I think that's an evolution as well. Now, do we still need more kit? Yes. Do we need to improve the, uh, the, the weapon system that we use to track all of that debris uh, on orbit? Yes. Um, so there's more work to do, but I do think we've certainly evolved the mindset and the TTPs um, uh, since, since 2007. Yes, sir. Yeah, TTPs are extremely important uh, with regard to developing that warfighting culture and that ethos necessary to utilize the systems 
that the Guardians must use to gain and maintain space superiority, uh, even if it's a regional space superiority mission. So thank you, sir, for that. So also in the interview we discussed last year, you mentioned that the Air Force was working on plans for a air component to U.S. Space Command. And I know there was a recent announcement about service components to U.S. Space Command. Do you have any updates for the audience on your perspective and how those components, those service components are gonna help bring space capabilities to the combatant command? Yeah, as a, as a guardian, I can uh, you know, give you a, a bit of an insight into that, but certainly the U.S. Air Force would be the best uh, posture to answer this question. But uh, the Air Force has presented first Air Force down at Tyndall Air Force Base as the Air Force component to U.S. Space Command. So technically now they're aft space. And for the, some of us in the uh, you know, community, uh, that takes us a moment to pause and think when that term gets thrown out. But uh, under, under the leadership of General Pierce there, they have leaned all in on this. And, and their initial set of taskings have to do with uh, human spaceflight support, which is incredibly ramped up. Now, you think back from the time the shuttle uh, you know, was retired, I think it was around 2012-ish, uh, up until the crew launches of the last uh, year, 18 months or so, uh, the only way Americans were going to space was on so Soyuz rockets out of, um, uh, you know, being launched by the Russians. And we had we had some support that would go forward into uh, Europe in, in case there was an emergency there. But now that we are once again, and let's be very happy that we are uh, launching American astronauts on American rockets from American soil uh, with the crew program and then soon to get into Orion and, and what NASA is about to do with Artemis, that human space flight support is really ramped up. And so who better to lead that for U.S. Space Command, their responsibilities, than the U.S. Air Force, because they are world experts in CSAR, and this is ultimately a search and rescue mission. And it's their skill sets, along with the, the Navy, uh, that really help, you know, support those astronauts. And I've, I've really uh, been impressed by how First Air Force has leaned into this, and then they have been working with General Burt and her team at Vandenberg uh, to do a right seat, left seat um, uh, training for them to take over that mission. And, uh, and I think it's really brought a great capability to U.S. Space Command. Great. Thank you, sir. And I, and I know that the current rank structure based on resources puts that representative, the lead of that team, that space component to the combat command at the 06 level. Perhaps there's an opportunity to examine whether or not that's the exact right rank structure uh, to be presenting service space capabilities to the combatant command. But I know that's not for this, this discussion, sir. I, I know there's plenty of opportunity to have that discussion at a later point. Sir, the CSO planning guidance published in 2020 provided clear guidance for how guardian leaders should approach decision-making within their organizations. A year later, how has that CSO's planning guidance shaped your approach to execution of missions and development of the missions in the space domain? And has there been feedback from US Space Command who you present capabilities to, to the Space Force on, on implementation of the CSO's planning guidance? Yeah, let me start with just a little bit of history. And I know many of your viewers will be familiar with this, but first we're building the Space Force on the shoulders of those who've come before us uh, in Air Force Space Command. And that was a venerable organization that, that you know, stood on the shoulders of organizations going all the way back to, to General Bernard Schriever and the Western Development Division. Um, and that or, those organizations built the world's best space capabilities, but we found that those space capabilities had not kept up with the threats as you and I have been talking about. And so we needed a space force now and a US Space Command to, to really accelerate that evolution. And the culture of those organizations, again, built us these great, um, these great uh, capabilities. But in Air Force Space Command, you know, we had centralized a lot of decision-making at, at higher levels for two reasons. One is going back to the 60s, 70s, and even into maybe the early 80s, a lot of our uh, rockets and satellites were kind of hand-built wooden shoes. And I remember I was at SOS in August-ish of uh, 1993, and we, we blew up a Titan IV rocket with, I think, a, 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 a ISR payload on top. And at the time, I heard that was a $1.5 billion loss, about $500 million or so on the rocket and about a billion on the, on the payload. I don't know if those numbers were right, but it's what I heard as a young captain. And so that, that tended to uh, make us a risk-adverse culture. You know, we can't afford billion and a half dollar um, uh, explosions on, on launch pads. And then at some point around 93, we also brought the, the missile uh, career field, the ICBM career field, and we married it up with space operations. And, and we were married together for almost 20 years. And, 
you know, nuclear forces are the foundation of U.S. Um, uh, foreign policy and certainly defense policy, that, that deterrent capability. But we don't typically ask those young operators to have a lot of uh, innovation because we want them to be very disciplined in a very understood and predictable way of operating. And so those two, uh, you know, kind of dynamics resulted in an organization that, that had pulled a lot of decision making to the top. Um, and, and so over the last several years, even in Air Force Space Command, we were trying to pivot that. Certainly senior leaders like Gerald Hyten, who recently retired, were working very hard to do that. And um, the Space Force has given us a whole new opportunity. So that, that's my history lesson. Thanks for sitting through that. Uh, but then General Raymond wrote his uh, CSO's planning guidance, the CPG, as we call it. And he articulated a couple really key points about decision making in there that kind of culminate this history and, and where we were trying to pivot Air Force Space Command. But he talked about it uh, in that CPG, empowering all levels and mission command and moving to command by negation. Now, command by negation is a really important term, and it's something that we often um, associate with our U.S. Navy. And the idea is, unless you're told otherwise, or unless a decision is not yours, you know, if it's reserved for somebody higher than you, you are free to act unless told not to. Now, that doesn't take away your responsibility to inform your chain of command if you're taking actions that they need to know about. Um, but it means you need to have a bias for action. And so that is something we are all working to implement across the space uh, force and space operations command today. Um, you know, now instead of taking COA briefs all the time uh, to General Raymond, we'll tell him what we're doing and say, sir, unless otherwise directed, this is what I'm going to do. And then if I, you know, if we don't hear back or, or if he uh, says good, then we press forward. But if he says, hey, I, I have an opinion about that. I'd like to be involved in that. Okay, then we'll pause and we'll we'll move in the direction that we get guidance on. But it's a way of, of creating this bias for action. And we're trying to implement that across all levels. Certainly, I would encourage you next time you interview a Delta or Garrison commander or, or, or a senior enlisted leader or squadron commander or superintendent, ask them that question. How do they think that's going? Because I think that would be illustrative. And then I think you asked, have we gotten any feedback from U.S. Space Command about implementation of the CPG? I don't know that specifically, you know, they've come back with, hey, here's what we think about you implementing the, the CPG. But I'll give you a couple points that I think uh, that I can tell are paying off for them. One of those changes was in our new Space Force structure, we decoupled our old wing structure where we had commanders and chiefs who were responsible for both mission execution and installation support. And now we have in, uh, organizations focused just on mission and we have separate organizations focused just on the garrisons. We have really seen a payoff on that. So now our deltas, they're the organizations focused on the space missions. We have seen US Space Command come in, for example, and say, hey, Delta Three Commander, you're responsible for all space force, space electronic for warfare. We're now going to give you the label of the lead for task force SEW, task force space electronic warfare. And you're going to be responsible to General Burt in her com uh, combined force space component command hat to do whatever planning that she needs at the tactical level for space electronic warfare across all the services, so bringing together Space Force and the Army SEW capabilities. So we, we've empowered that individual to run that uh, Delta Three organization, and I think the joint side has seen that, and now they're they're leveraging that for their own purposes. And we, I could tell that same story across multiple of our Deltas. So hopefully that got after your point about how we're trying to push that authority down and give them the, the lead uh, responsibility for their mission area. And we're seeing that uh, pay off in spades uh, across both the uh, space mission and the garrisons. Great, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. You know, the other thing you bring up uh, that's really important is prioritization of the capabilities that the Space Systems Command now needs to look at providing to not just you, but also to the combatant commands and, and U.S. Spacecom obviously is one of those. So in your last interview, you talked a little bit about that transition. Now, can you talk a little bit about that current role in the process is to provide the operator's voice and perspective to the acquisition process? How has the recent Russian destructive anti-satellite test changed the message from or turned up the volume on the operator's voice to Space Systems Command? 
Yeah, and let me just talk a bit about that Russian ASAT test. You know, you might be able to go back to 2007. The Chinese were fairly new space actors at that point. And maybe you could say they didn't fully understand what they were doing. Now let's talk about Russia. Russia is a historic space and sophisticated space power. First man-made object in orbit, Sputnik. First living animal uh, in orbit, the dog. I think it was Lakia or Lakia. Uh, first man, first woman. Uh, so Russia looked at what they were going to do, shoot down their own satellite at an altitude above the uh, International Space Station, create long-lived debris, and they still made the decision to do it, to send a message to the world and to the United States about what capabilities they were developing. So you asked, did this really change the narrative or change the voice of the operator, elevate the voice of the operator with uh, Space Systems Command? And I would say no, because this is the world in which we know that we're living today. And so the Russians have really just validated the very reasons that have led to the creation of Space Force and U.S. Space Command. Now, talking about our relationship with Space Systems Command, you know, if we went back to the Air Force Space Command days, Space and Missile Systems Center, SMC, was a part of Air Force Space Command. And so Air Force Space Command truly had the organized, train and equip mission for space for the Air Force. Here at Spock, we don't talk about us having the organized, train and equip mission for the Space Force anymore because we don't have the equipping mission. That is now Space Systems Command and the other development agencies like Space RCO and Space Development Agency and DAF RCO and others. And we're also not the lead training command anymore, although we do have some very important training responsibilities, but we have Space Training and Readiness Command or STARCOM. And all three of us as sister field commands have to work together now. And certainly General Gutlein and I have a very positive and very good relationship. And that relationship extends through all of our levels of command on both of our sides. And so he's not bashful about giving me a call if needed and saying, hey, Stephen, I need more operator involvement in some you know, uh, tests that we're doing or some uh, evolution. And we just aren't getting the operator voice that we need. And I'm not shy about going to him and saying, hey, Mike, on some program that y'all are working, we don't see the path for it delivering what we need. Uh, you know, how can we work together uh, to, to make sure that we, we, we all understand this the same or get it on the right path? And so um, those, are the, those are the robust conversations that we're having. And it's all about delivering for the Space Force and Space Command and the other combatant commands the capability that we need to operate in the face of these threats like the Russian ASAT test. Thank you, sir. No, that's a, that's a great perspective. And you're right, there is a process in place to ensure that the operators have what they need based on the new organizational structure of the Space Force. So I'm sure everyone is, is really excited about that. Sir, as a top operator of Space Operations Command, what are you looking for in new Guardian accessions? And what should our commissioning sources be doing to cultivate the new culture and identity for our newest recruits on both the officer and enlisted side? Well, this is something that is just really exciting. You know, the size and scale of the Space Force is completely different from the other um, services in the DOD. Now, those of us who grew up in the Air Force and in the DOD, we think of the Coast Guard as being small. And I've had a chance to serve along the, uh, or, or live on a U.S. Coast Guard base and I would say I'm not sure there's anywhere in our federal government that the taxpayers get better bang for the buck than the U.S. Coast Guard. But I'm told that military and civilian, they're about 45,000 people. The Space Force is one third that size. And so I think, uh, you know, 15, 16,000 is where we're probably going to end up with uh, military and civilian. And it's our, it's our charge that others will look at us and say that, you know, we're the best value for the taxpayer dollar in the U.S. government. So, that means we're going to assess officer and enlisted about 700 to 800 people per year, guardians per year. Now, the U.S. Air Force is something 30, 40,000. I think the Army's 70 or 80,000. So the scale is just radically different. And how we can go out and headhunt those seven to 800 young women and men that we want to bring in, I think is a real opportunity for us. You know, instead of just trying to emblazon 1 800 call Space Force everywhere in a sporting venue and trying to get those young uh, men and women to call us, I think we can go headhunt them and target them and go find that young woman who just won a national robotics or cyber or rocketry competition. And we go to her specifically and, and let her know what we can, you know, that we could use her. 
and, and how we could help her uh, in her uh, you know, career aspirations. So that's one thing. It's a different model of going out and trying to attract those young men and women because our scale is so radically different. And then I think the Guardian Ideal, which has recently been published, really is an aspirational document that talks about a different way of uh, attracting and, and managing talent. And so I think we got to live up to that as we move forward. And a big part of that is listening to these young men and women. And uh, as they come in and hearing their great ideas, and again, empowering them to, uh, to make a real difference. Now, Private industry is fantastic in this country. It's the second golden age of space led by these, these companies that are doing so many awesome things in space. And they'll always be able to outpay um, those, in, those great young men and women. But the quality of service and quality of life that we can offer these guardians, they can do things in the space force that they cannot do you know, out on the outside. And, and we're going to want to uh, grab them and give them that quality of service. And then, and then some of them, absolutely, we'll want to go work for those great companies, American companies, and then we'll keep them on as a reservist, a guardsman, a part-timer, whatever we end up with, where we can leverage their outside experience, but leverage them inside the service as well. Um, so, you know, that's, we, we want smart, ag aggressive um, uh, folks who work well in teams and aren't afraid to contribute from moment one when they walk, walk into our service. Great. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's a, uh, as you said, the Guardian Ideal really sets that up for to be that aspirational document so folks can understand how important that is and the fact that uh, they can achieve basically whatever career that they want based on that, that ideal. So thank you for that. Sir, if it's okay, we'll just take a, a couple of questions from the audience. I know how busy you are. So if, if we get through a couple of these, that'd be great. Uh, maybe one and then we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, sir, as we continue to develop, here's one, it says, as we continue to develop, advocate for future systems mission sets for the Space Force, what's your opinion on the need for a parallel effort to advocate for space policy that enables the use of these systems? Yeah, you know, we've seen over the last several administrations a real focus on national space policy. And that, that national space policy has recognized that, uh, you know, access to space and the ability to operate in space in a, in, a, in a way of our choosing, that's a vital national interest to us. And now we've seen a couple administrations running with a, a revitalized National Space Council that's working specific aspects of that policy. And we certainly are supportive of all of that. But really what we're seeing is that national policy has, has had to respond to uh, this uh, new environment. We find ourselves in space where countries are you know, showing publicly the threats that they're now building to try to uh, prove to us that they can deny us the space capabilities that we have spent so many decades developing and that are absolutely foundational to not only how we defend this country, but also our very society and economies as well. And so, of course, this is one of the reasons we've seen those partner countries come to us and the way we've worked with them because they recognize this importance as well. So I think there is a need to constantly be reevaluating uh, our, our national policies, just like uh, each administration always does, to make sure that we are best postured to succeed in the um, environment we now find ourselves in. And of course, none of us want there to be a war that starts in or extends into space. We want, uh, we want to be able to continue to use space peacefully, and, uh, and hopefully we can achieve that, continue to achieve that, uh, through uh, deterrent actions, and and that's our that's our desired end state. Great, thank you, sir. Sir, now this is kind of a, a interesting question, but I'm curious if you're willing to have the discussion. If we were, if Hollywood was to produce a movie about the Space Force, what, in your opinion, would that storyline be? Wow, that's a good question. You know. Uh, you know, first of all, it, it's going to have to be entertaining because uh, people aren't going to go to a movie if it's not entertaining. But, um, you, you know, just like I think uh, uh, the American people understand um, that we have, we do have vital interests around the world, that if Western Europe, for example, was invaded, that would be something that we would care deeply about as a nation. If, uh, if, our, if our friends in North America, like Canada, were somehow threatened, if, uh, if New York City or Washington or, or L.A., uh, were threatened by terrorist or, or military attack, uh, that would, you know, the American people would certainly understand that. You know, uh, as we said, space is foundational to our economy, our society, and our, and our way of uh, fighting, uh, you know, and defending ourselves. 
I, I think there's a story to be told there about how if we if we lost those access to space capabilities, what that would mean uh, for the uh, the average American, uh, the average uh, citizen around the world, and why that's worth fighting to preserve and, and making sure that we have the capabilities uh, to uh, to continue to to provide those space services. So I'm not a screenwriter. We need to go out to the SAG uh, Screen Actors Guild and get one. Uh, but I think there's a story to be told there, um, and then we would get to spotlight the awesome uh, guardians, uh, airmen, and other service members who contribute uh, in the space domain. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Sir, thanks so much for taking time today. Any closing comments for our audience? Well, it's just an amazing time to be uh, in the Space Force and in Space Operations Command. Uh, I wasn't alive. Or I don't remember. I was alive, but I don't remember when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. I was one. Um, and so I, I can't uh, understand the excitement firsthand that must have been in the United States and around the world. Um, but I was in Europe on the 50th anniversary of that, and I could not believe their level of excitement. You know, they really looked at that as a, a whole human achievement. And I do think we're in the second golden age of space today, where that similar level of excitement is out there with, with the uh, American people and the, the publics of other countries. And I think, uh, you know, within our lifetime, we're going to see uh, cislunar as a regular operating location. We're going to see the next um, man and the first woman to step back on the moon, uh, you know, Americans uh, in the next few years. And we're going to see people go to Mars. And I'm not betting against there being a, a, a full-time Mars colony by the time, uh, you know, uh, my life hopefully comes to, a, to an end at, at the end of a long period. And so uh, this is just an amazing time. And I appreciate all the supporters that we have, all those who are, who are working in industry and in other parts of the U.S. government. Uh, to support, you know, this new second golden age of space. And again, our, our goal is to make sure that, that uh, it, it remains peaceful and that the U.S. and our allies can, can be, have full freedom of action in space to take advantage of all these amazing things that space has for us. Thank you again, sir, for taking time. Again, thank you to our sponsor, Decision Lens, for sponsoring this interview. And sir, we have some exciting announcements coming up to where we are going to be presenting uh, all of the new accessions into the Space Force at the Air Force Academy with rank that has been flown on the Inspiration4 flight led by Jared Isaacman uh, later on this month. So we hope to see you there, sir. That'll definitely be a live event. And additionally, instead of hosting large scale conferences that those are phenomenal opportunities to get folks together and collaborate, what, what we're going to do as an organization is host smaller space innovation summits that focus on very specific objectives and have uh, those discussions around those industries that can support those specific mission sets. And so you can be sure that you're going to be invited to those space innovation summits as we continue to collaborate and bring together civil, industry, education, and of course, the military sectors. So again, sir, thanks so much for your time. Really do appreciate it. And we look forward to chatting with you very, very soon about all the successes in this new year. Congratulations, sir, and talk to you soon. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it.